All right. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, I'm Ravisha. I've been, uh, I did my LLM from Queen Mary in 2015. And I'm right now litigating uh, in uh, based out of New Delhi. And uh, I uh, deal with criminal as well as civil, commercial, all kinds of disputes. So yes, that's about me. I'll hand over to Ojas Vipa. Excellent. Hey, Ravisha. Uh, hello, Mrs. Narwal. So good to have you on board and to have this discussion with you. Okay. I am Ojas Vipa. You can call me Ojas. I am currently working as the general counsel uh, for Securitas for the region Africa, Middle East, APAC. And uh, when uh, I'm also an alumni of uh, Queen Mary, I did my LLM in commercial and corporate law. Uh, it's been fantastic knowing Mr. Mishra now for about 10 years since I was a student and he has been spearheading this chapter. So uh, without further delay, I will hand it over to him to start the session. Thank you very much. So the, uh, Jesse, very warm welcome. A very brief introduction about uh, uh, a Center for Commercial, uh, uh, commercial Law Studies, uh, which is part of Queen Mary. And uh, we started this India chapter uh, in 2020. Uh, and since then we have grown this chapter, we have got more than 500 uh, plus members. We have got uh, a sub chapter in Delhi and uh, Mumbai. And we, we come together and listen to these inspiring stories uh, where people, uh, lawyers have done significantly well. So today we have you as our victim. So we'll start <laughs> the session. <laughs> so we'll start this session. Uh, so very warm welcome uh, and very welcome to those who have uh, joined us. Uh, as a background, uh, I'm very delighted to introduce uh, Jesse Narwal. Uh, who's qualified barrister and experienced Crown Prosecutor, uh, Chief Crown Prosecutor uh, for a very large area in England and has a track record of handling complex and very high profile cases. Those who, uh, those who are in, in UK and frequent to BBC News, uh, there are various occasions we have seen her uh, for her cases, what she has recently the, represented uh, on behalf of government. Uh, so she's she is very well known figure. She has been in profession. She has been with CPS for more than thirty years. She joined the organization in nineteen eighty nine, and she qualified as barrister in nineteen ninety three. That is not reflection of age at all. <laughs> you make me feel very old now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so we'll we'll straight away start with the session. Uh, uh, and first question for you is. Uh, Tell us a bit about your journey as a lawyer. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll say that. Tell us from uh, from start with all yeah. that started. So yeah, thank, thank yeah. you. Well, I just, um, a huge kind of honour for you to invite me here, and I'm really um, privileged to come and speak to you. So thank you for the opportunity. So I'm very kind of um, happy to kind of share my journey, um, and it's important I share my journey. So I'll try and paint a picture for you if I can as to what led me to where I am. And believe you me, at the end you'll realise it wasn't always planned. Um, so things happen, and um, you make decisions and you make choices, um, but you can't always plan things, which is the one thing I will say. So I'm. Um, I was born in the UK. I'm second generation Asian from a Sikh background. My parents came over in the 1960s from the Punjab. Um, and when they came over, their challenges were clearly very tough. They had to deal with the language issues, the weather, uh, finding a place where they could call home. And they came here with the mentality that they were just here temporarily, always thinking that they would go back um, to um, India um, after they made a decent living here. Um, but um, as you know, um, they never did. <laughs> um, and they kind of stayed here and made a home here. Um, and, and this is where um, I was born. And my generation and my children's um, generation, we do call it home here, but we have a very strong link to India, I think. Um, not not just because it's, it's it, we're not, completely accepted here in the kind of UK because there are those challenges and we have to be honest about that um, but also because 
that's that's our history, that's our background, and it's really important to be able to acknowledge that. And there have been kind of challenges um, in the past, and as I've been growing up in relation to um, quite overt racism when I was growing up. Um, I had to kind of work hard in order to overcome some of those very overt um, um, discriminations that you have, not just because you're a woman, but also because um, you're not white um, and a combination of those things. Um, but those are things you learn to kind of live with. So having a strong work ethic, strong family and community values, I think overall a happy childhood and, and, and education, which was the one thing I knew could really make a difference um, to my life. And that's why um, I'll always value the importance of education and talk about education. And one thing was I loved learning. Um, and um, as you know, I'm quite old. <laughs> so we had no computers, no internet. The days of going to the library and borrowing up to five books, we used to be able to go to the local library, borrow up to five books. I took real pleasure in that because it opened up my mind, it opened up a different world. And you could borrow up to five books, I'd always borrow up to five books. And my passion then was more to do with politics. So um, not law at that time. Um, and the world then was very different. Um, the world was in the 60s. I was, I was born in um, um, the late 60s. Um, and I had an older brother and sister. They were born in India and came here and I had two younger sisters. I was the only one who went to university. Um, and because I had a passion for law, I applied to do law. But in fact, I read politics at university. And then after that, I undertook my law studies and my bar exams. But right from when I was small, I think I always had a sense of what was right and wrong from a young age. And I don't know where that came from. I kind of put it down to my paternal grandfather, who um, was a subedar in the British Indian Army and um, very well educated and was always a bit of a novice lawyer. So I think that's where it might come from. <laughs> so um, one of the other um, kind of things uh, was I'd get involved in family discussions. Often it was my dad and uncles and the male members of the family when they'd gather together at family events discussing politics or world issues. And I'd always kind of note that no women were part of this discussion. So rather than play with toys or my sisters or cousins or play with dolls, I'd sit and I'd listen and sometimes try and get involved um, in that men's huddle, that male huddle. Um, I didn't know, little did I know then, that was my training when I was small to be a lawyer from that young tender age. And it's only when I look back and people ask me about my journey, I talk about the small things that made a difference, that built the layers of resilience, that got me to think and weigh up arguments for and against, to be able to hold my own when um, I'm having a discussion and not be upset if someone didn't um, agree with me. Um, I grew up not having privileges. I wasn't from a privileged family. My parents, when they came over, they had manual jobs, but they were extremely supportive and they never stopped me from fulfilling my curiosities. And I think from there, I achieved a great deal. Um, so as I said, the first to go to university in my family, um, the first, first to play hockey, for my city, for my county, for my university. Um, the first to move away from home at um, 18 years old. And when you do look back and you think, what, what did inspire me? The environment, um, people, um, I think the one constant thing and important because it, we are celebrated International Women's Day was my mother. Whatever adversity, however tough her life was, she provided the love and warmth and compassion to allow me to reach my full potential. And she was progressive in her thinking, didn't want to hold back, wasn't traditional in that sense, and wanted me to kind of flourish. And I think the other thing when I talk about the environment was what was happening around um, me, um, the families who were struggling, seeing the injustice. And I didn't see it as injustice. That's not the words I would use or how I saw it when I was young but I could see there were inequalities. You could see the unfairness. Um, 
And you'd experience that. And I'd experienced that as I was growing up, um, looking to see why, when I knew I was just as good as the, uh, my white friend, why she was kind of picked to lead or to represent. And that's when you do start to question as you get older, as a child, um, why you're not being selected. And you think, well, if I've got the ability, um, is it because I'm different? And then you start to look at your differences. And you start to think, is it my gender? Is it my skin color? So I think I was always very conscious of those, those kind of factors. Um, I won a scholarship from the Crown Prosecution Service, so they've got their money back. <laughs> <laughs> so they had a good investment. Um, well done. <laughs> so I did my bar exams and I was lucky because that helped me financially and it helped me to move to London. I was born in Yorkshire um, and I moved to London when I was 21. Um, and I was called to, and I, that's when I joined the CPS in 1989. And then I was, I won a scholarship and then I did my law exams and my bar finals. And I was called to the bar. I'm a member of Inner Temple in 1993, as you said, Ajit. Um, and at that time, that was the only place you could study your bar exams in the entire country. So it's extremely competitive. Now, obviously, there's different educational establishments where you can do uh, your bar exams. Um, and I did, I did shipping law, I did some commercial law, um, and do you know what, it didn't excite me, um, <laughs> I just could not um, be interested in it, and the one thing I've always been interested in is in people, and I think that's what led me to criminal law, um, not just the sense of injustice or inequality, but I was interested in human behaviour and human interaction. And I think it's something, criminal law is something you can relate to. Um, but at that time, um, as you know, the legal world, um, especially here in the UK, <laughs> um, is sometimes, I'm sure you'll agree, is, is quite slow to change. Um, we hold on to our traditions um, and we hold on to the pomp and ceremony that adds to the whole solemnity, I think, of the justice system. Um, for an advanced, highly educated country like the UK, when I was called to the bar, when I wanted to go into do my pupillage, it was extremely difficult. And at the time, what existed were ghetto chambers. So ghetto chambers, an absolutely awful term, which was used by those from BAME backgrounds, um, different ethnic backgrounds, who could only get pupillage in order to qualify as a barrister um, from the ghetto chambers. I was lucky because I was sponsored and I had the scholarship from the Crown Prosecution Service. I was able to go into a mainstream set of chambers. In fact, it's the same chambers um, I went to as Mrs. Justice Chima Grubb, who's, oh. been, a friend of, who's been a friend of mine since, since the early 90s. Yes, I know, I know you've been hosting um, her. Just a uh, few days back. Yeah, yeah, um, in India. So she's a very good friend of mine and, and she's been a very good kind of mentor and we've been kind of friends um, all the way kind of through. But if you go back to that time, and this is just in the mid 90s, I go back to that time and qualifying as a barrister, you think about the era, um, I couldn't wear trousers or a trouser suit if I appeared as an advocate in court when I was a young barrister. Um, and often the judge would, you'd, you'd, you'd make your pleadings and the judge would say, I can't hear you, Miss Narwhal. I can't hear you. Of course they could hear me. What they were saying was they didn't want to hear me because I wasn't dressed in um, a skirt or um, a dress suit. Um, so that just simple things like that, when you think that wasn't an awful long time ago, was it? And if you think marital rape in the UK was only made illegal around 1992. So... It was very different back then. And when I joined the CPS, hardly anybody was there who looked like me. And my colleagues who were going to the bar, and many of them are judges now or they're King's Counsel, they questioned why I was becoming a prosecutor and not a defence barrister. Um, and, I, and, and because that was a natural pathway, wasn't it? You, you, you go and defend um, your people. Um, and my thought and my thinking on that was I could actually make a difference on the inside. So I went through the ranks, I worked hard, and yes, I had a lot of knockbacks. I've been sad, I've been happy, I've been ignored, and I've been celebrated over my years. Um, and my first time I became a prosecutor was in, was in central London, uh, prosecuting my first case. I was prosecuting a, um, a prostitute um, who was loitering um, for the, 
loitering with intent. Um, and one of the, you know, common summary only offences we have in the magistrate's court. So this was that Marlborough magistrate's court. I stood up, my hand, I remember kind of shaking with the paper because we only had paper in those days and paper files. But she pleaded guilty like they all do because we had used to have lots of overnight cases where the arrests were made overnight and half of them would be prostitutes because of the red light area. And that was my first case I always remember. She pleaded guilty, she got fined 35 pounds, she got a 20 pounds costs. And I sat down with this big, oh, and that was my first kind of ad <laughs> advocacy doing a doing cases like that. And since then, I've dealt with drugs cases, you know, theft, traffic, assaults, murder, robberies, um, all of that to build my career. But it starts off where, you know, it's a routine volume type of criminal cases. So all the shoplifting from Oxford Street, I used to um, um, prosecute. Um, I, I, I used to get a deal with all the homicide in London when I became head of the Old Bailey unit. But I became a senior crime prosecutor quite quickly. Um, I was good at what I did. Um, I was ambitious. I was determined. I knew I could do more. So then I was dealing with more serious cases in the Crown Court. I learned my trade. It was tough. And you're up against people who don't always support you. But one thing I was always careful about was making sure I had the right friends on side who I could talk about my cases with. If I felt it wasn't going right, I had somewhere to go. So about 2004, I became the, the head of the Old Bailey unit. And that was, I think that was one of my most fascinating jobs because I dealt with all the homicide cases pan London, including the Atwal case, Atwal and Atwal, where in fact, I instructed Mrs. Justice Chima Grubb, she was junior treasury counsel then to be the junior barrister on a case where it we, where I convicted the oldest woman um, in the UK for murder um, and conspiracy to murder and her son because they took she took her daughter-in-law it was his wife to India where they strangled her and and, and threw her body into the river Sutledge and um, we had no body and it was a cold case review murder and I knew I needed somebody with a South Asian background to be able to understand it. And so I had Bobby Chima Grubb, um, who was my junior barrister. I sent her to India, in fact, to liaise with the Punjabi police. We had no body, no forensics, but we had the other daughter-in-law who was able to tell us about the planning of that case. I'm doing a whole program on that on Netflix later, so I'll tell you about that next time. <laughs> um, but I used to do with all the murder in London, we used to have about, 300 homicides across London. One of the most interesting jobs I had, everything from domestic homicides to organized crime uh, murders to your single punch manslaughters. And then I became a chief crime prosecutor. My first posting was in 2007 and I got moved to Lincolnshire. And I think as a woman, the difficulty was me because I was married by then and I had two young children. I had to balance my, my home life with my professional life. And that was quite tough. Uh, my husband was a freelance, worked in media, wasn't a lawyer. Um, and I had to move the family. We kept the house in London, but we had to move the family. And Lincolnshire is very, very different. I got to Lincolnshire, it's another large region, but it was something where they only had five murders a year and I'd come from dealing with 300 a year. So it's very different, a rural county. I remember one of the cases from there um, where it was a case where I prosecuted a father. He'd adapted his Land Rover vehicle and he, we prosecuted him for causing the death of four out of his six children, I think it was then, um, because he adapted his car and it was illegal the way he had adapted it. So it was so dangerous and had um, he kind of veered and fell into a kind of river and his children, very sadly, four children had died. And I was under a great deal of pressure there not to prosecute the father because they said he'd already lost his children and this was callous to prosecute. But I did because it was right to prosecute that case um, because he posed a threat to his children. And it would also send a message out to others around driving very dangerous vehicles. I got threats as a result of prosecuting that case. I got threats because people would say, well, who are you? Where do you come from? Because my name was foreign and Lincolnshire is a very non-diverse county, um, probably about 99.9% .9 white. Um, and those are the types of things I had to deal with. I then kind of moved on to become a chief crown prosecutor for Sussex on the South Coast. 
in 2010 and then became head of or the deputy head of the National Fraud Division dealing with white collar crime from the City of London and also with international fraud um, dealing with proceeds of crime as well. Um, I dealt with the well, I was also the deputy head of the Welfare Rural Health National Division, dealt with the horse meat scandal when it started to go into the food chain in this country. Um, 2014, I became a chief crown prosecutor for the whole southeast region, Kent, Surrey and Sussex, dealt with the channel tunnel migration issues, dealt with immigration offences, cross-border crime, um, liaised a great deal with the French authorities there. Um, dealt with the Alps murder. You might recall it was an Iraqi family who had gone to France and they'd been murdered there in the Alps. Still not solved to this day. So we led on that. I led on that um, investigation because the French would only speak to the French police would only speak to the UK prosecutors. The father, mother, and mother-in-law were killed, and the two daughters luckily survived the shooting. Uh, with one of them who was kind of shot when she was hiding under her mother's skirt in the car. Still hasn't been solved to this day, but we had to put a joint investigation team together. Then in 2018, I became the Chief Crown Prosecutor for the Thames and Chiltern region, where I currently am. Dealt with the um, um, murder of PC Harper, uh, which was in the news at the time. And this is where a police officer went to investigate a nighttime burglary. And then his foot got caught when he was... Um, pursuing the burglars in the rope and he was dragged for nearly two miles and died as a result of that and we managed to prosecute that case and then as recently I've dealt with the David Carrick case which is a metropolitan police officer who raped abused physically and sexually um, 13 um, victims over a 17 year period whilst he was a police officer and that case absolutely kind of pivotal impacting on criminal justice. So I have been involved in lots of high profile and routine cases. And, and I think as a prosecutor, that's been really important for me throughout my time where I've been able to now rise to be currently the only Asian uh, female, in fact, the only Asian chief crown prosecutor and the only Asian currently female chief crown prosecutor in, um, in England and Wales. And when I look at all of this, when I look to see, well, what, what is my role? Um, my role is to deliver justice and to deliver justice for all. It's not to get a conviction at any cost, it's to deliver justice. And that's why when I feel the case has not met our tests, I will not prosecute it. But we work with communities. Um, I work with communities and to give a voice to communities because I'm also the national lead for honour-based abuse and forced marriage and female genital mutilation. And there's still not a great understanding around honour-based abuse and so I make sure that we educate, raise awareness, we prosecute these cases as well, and all the criminal justice agencies better understand them. But when you look at this, all of this, I think the important part of it is me being a woman and my leadership and responsibilities and my duties, not just to carve away for me and my career, but to look over my shoulder and make sure that I'm opening that door to others who look like me. And I make sure that there are opportunities for others who look like me, because there's no point in me reaching this position if I don't have a pipeline of talented women coming through. And that's why I, I role model, that's why I do mentoring, I do kind of coaching to help, to give something back. And sadly, I've lived in a world where it's not been very diverse, it's not been equitable, it's not been inclusive. And you've, I've had to challenge, I've had to question, um, and I just don't accept the norm. And I think it has knocked me back sometimes when I do challenge because um, I think lawyers like conformity um, a lot as well. Um, and when I look back um, over my life, um, I think it's helped me be the person I am. Um, it's helped me be principled. Um, I haven't compromised. Um, and I've made sure my underlying motives throughout my career has been to make a difference, to be at that table, to be at the top table, and not just to be at the top table, but to have a voice and to have that voice heard so that when we're making decisions, we're making them with a very diverse view, uh, viewpoint and very diverse backgrounds. And I hope I've been able to kind of, kind of do that, um, but it's not been easy. Um, but I don't define myself um, as being an Asian female lawyer 
um, I define myself as a, as a prosecutor because I think that's really important um, for, um, for me because I don't want people to um, justify me in that way. Um, I don't want it to detract in that way because I should be known for my kind of talents. And I think that is a, an approach um, which has been helpful. Um, but I've also um, had to kind of smash some of those kind of stereotypes. I've had to kind of challenge my bosses who are often, who are often male and white. Um, and I've had to smile and above all, think about how I can kind of influence, but use my experience and expertise and competence to kind of move forward. And there has been great progress over the years. And the Crown Prosecution Service now is, is, is very good in terms of its employment. It's well over 60% female in both the legal and non-legal roles. At the seniority, we've got nearly a good kind of 50-50 um, split nearly. So it's, it's done really, really well. But what I would kind of, kind of say is I, I have been discouraged by setbacks, but I've learned from them and it's made me stronger to go forward. And I have had to look at the equality of opportunity um, and be able to talk about fairness and inclusion and be able to uh, have some very uncomfortable discussions. Um, because if you don't have those uncomfortable discussions, then you don't make change. So that's been important. And I think with International Women's Day and embracing equity, that theme itself um, does recognize that people start from different places. So you can't have true inclusion and belonging unless you have equitable action. And you can only have equitable action when you think, well, somebody hasn't had the same education or hasn't had the same start because everyone is coming from a different place. So we have to have policies which recognize um, or have equitable solutions in the workplace and the right resources and the opportunities and the targeting of those to try and get an equal outcome is important because if we don't, then and you we, we assume that our goal is equality, but we don't think about how we're getting there. And equity is about how we take the diverse lived experience of individuals and communities and we adapt our services and policies according to those differences. And then we try and get long-term sustainable solutions. So we have to embrace equity and understand what it means. Um, and we have to be able to talk about that openly. And as women, I think we've got a lot better at being believing in ourselves, beating our own drum, I'm bringing men on, bro on board, like you, Ajit, who's a very good champion, um, to understand our challenges and be there as an advocate for us too. So I hope that's kind of given you kind of some kind of insight into, into my journey. The journey's not finished. I'm still on that journey, but always learning from it. So it it's a very inspiring journey. And as we say in legal profession, uh, it's a profession dominated by white men private school educated and Oxbridge uh, yeah. coming from wealthy families, you tick no boxes None and still look at you where you are. It's, yeah. it's really inspiring. And I was reading, in fact, two things which caught my attention today. One was uh, uh, United Nations, uh, in fact, yesterday, that was a news article which was there and United Nations said that gender equality is something uh, which is growing and uh, in, in a negative way, the, uh, it's growing and it will take more, if it grows at inequality, gender in, inequality, if it grows at same rate what it is growing now, mm -hmm. it will take more than 300 years to Gosh. achieve what we are going, we want to achieve yeah. as a society. Yeah. Second thing which caught my attention today was Law Society's website and uh, this is a bit old data where they say that uh, around 57% of lawyers who uh, 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 women lawyers who uh, qualify, they get training contract and associate, but to reach that top level and yeah. uh, getting partnership, it, it reduces to less than 24%. Mm -hmm. And when, when it comes to magic circle law firms, it's yeah. as low as 9%. Yeah. So now uh, somebody like you who has made their, uh, her way coming from an Asian origin, okay, uh, minority, and 
being over here, that's that's very inspiring. Uh, so as, as, as we discussed, today's theme was more on gender equality uh, and how we are going to achieve that, how you have seen gender, gender inequality in, in your profession and how you have overcome that. Yeah. So when we, when we look at gender inequality, and it's something we look at now in the profession, um, you've got um, under 30% of the, of the judges um, are from a diverse background. So everything you say about white, middle class, privately educated, that still exists. And you've got um, about 39% of all barristers um, are female. Um, so if you look at that, you can see there's a long way to go. I mean, we look, if we just look at gender, because there's lots of other diverse characteristics, how do you get that gender equality? Well, first of all, you have to recognize it. Because if you don't recognize it, then you're not going to address it. And you have to start counting it and you have to have the right data. And if you don't have the right data and you don't count something, then nothing changes. So it's important, I think, when we're looking um, at gender for example we look at the gender gap um so now we're getting better at talking about who's on who's on the board level who are partners who are in the top positions then the next question is what are we doing about it so not just have diversity policies and inclusion policies because it's a tick box exercise and you've got it but then you put it into the bottom drawer nothing happens how do you actually address the changes how do you actually ensure that you are uh, making progress and that is through um, practical pragmatic approaches so do you have positive discrimination do you have quotas um, if you have quotas are you offending the equality laws um, have you got are you targeting particular communities is your is your law firm representing the communities that you serve? Where are you drawing the people who work from you from? Do you know if you have self-declaration statistics in your organizations, which will tell you those figures? Then how do you impact that pipeline in order to have the longer term vision, not 300 years, but the longer term vision in order to bring through people who will join scholarship schemes, um, who will have exposure to experience in some of those magic circle law firms. How do we partner people? Because fear is one of those things. Thinking that quality will be diluted is another challenge. And I think these are all myths which need to be smashed. So it does come to the strategy and it comes to an organizational um, policy, but it also comes down to how the um, government sees this and what the narrative in society is as well on some of these issues. Now, I don't know if I've lost you, Ajit, because you've disappeared from my screen. No, I'm here. I'm here and I'm listening. Oh, you've come back. I'm very yeah. carefully. I'm listening. Yeah. So I think some of those some of those practical issues, because what there's one thing talking about it, but how do we translate it? How does it move across? And I think we've got to challenge, haven't we? What, what is it? How many people from a diverse background do you have? Um, and we need to be able to talk in environments like this, which is not for the already converted, but we need to go into broader, wider environments to be able to be. And I've often been in a room full of white middle-aging men um, and I've always had to prove myself more I've always had to set up my track record when nobody else has to so mm. that I'm giving myself more credibility now why should I have to do that I have to do it because there's still a perception that I'm the token person who's there and and, and not there because of my ability and that's the thing we have to challenge mm. very helpful uh now, when you're not a lawyer, what you do, I can see a Bollywood book just behind you. <laughs> and, and I thought that whole whole career of being a criminal lawyer, that was inspired by that book. 
So, <laughs> <laughs> I must yeah. be really wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not a big Bollywood fan, but my, my husband used to work in media, so he was the one who, um, in, but, but I do, I absolutely, I'm fascinated by Bollywood. In fact, I was watching something on um, a documentary called The Romantics about Yash Raj and the way he developed his films, because I like the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, so my spare time, in fact, I don't have a lot because I have, um, my children are older now, um, but I still have family responsibilities uh, towards them. And I still have to um, make sure I run a household. So all those things, however professional we are as women, we still have the uh, overall responsibility to run our households, make sure the family's happy, make sure the extended family um, is content. But I, I'm getting better. So I do... I do do um, a lot of yoga now to relax. Um, I do uh, keep up with sports. Um, I, but I, I also sit as a kind of um, a, a panel member on the FA sports um, mm -hmm. football, grassroots football to, to judge um, serious cases there. Um, and I like socializing and I like cooking and I like all those things that help me relax. But I will never watch... Uh, crime documentaries or anything like that because I don't want to do that in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, of course. But thank you so much. And I can see my community members, they are getting slightly impatient. I'm taking too much time and they have to interact with you as well. So over to Ujaswita. Thank you so much, Ajit. Uh, first of all, it's such a pleasure to listen to you. Um, this is now all to your entire journey. It's truly inspiring. And uh, it's so relatable. Like I can only imagine what things were like 20 years ago. Uh, like I told you, I worked for a Swedish organization. When yeah. I joined the company three and a half years ago, uh, it was a regional leadership team of seven people yeah. with six white men in light blue shirts and me. Uh -huh. And it was, it was a completely different scenario. Things have changed a lot since then. Yeah. But uh, I want to actually ask you about something that you kind of touched in your previous question, your previous answer. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you have to prove yourself just because of your gender. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times people would assume that you are there because of the tokenism, because you are a woman and you're because of your color. How have you handled that? Have you faced that? And how have you handled that uh, whenever you did face yeah. it? Yeah, and it's something I still continue to have to deal with, um, Jasvita, because I deal with senior judiciary, senior police officers who are chief constables. I deal with MPs in my stakeholder management and relationships in my kind of job. Um, and I've kind of, I have got used to it, and, I, and it's an expectation, and I anticipate that. So, um, I've got better at it over the kind of years, but at the beginning, I used to get quite upset thinking, well, look, I'm just as good as him or her, uh, only because I'm brown, am I being treated differently? And I'm not here because of tokenism. I've had to work damn hard, studying through the nights, balancing everything to get here, but I don't want to share that with them. That's my personal journey, which I don't need to share with them to get their sympathy. So how do you do it? So for me, it was about, um, the communications and not about proving myself legally with them, but about being, being, being knowledgeable on some of the social matters, about networking, um, establishing a name, about being able to do presentations, about being able to um, know my subject matter, um, being able to ask appropriate questions. And for the Crown Prosecution Service is... It's, it's not part of government, but we're funded by government. So it's part of the establishment. So there's a certain way in which things are done and said. And I've had to learn all of that over the years. You know when to speak, when not to speak. But when you do speak, it's the right thing. So it's not taking on every single um, battle. It's picking your battles and the ones that are going to make a difference. And I think through that time, it's having to engage with the people who you think you, you can get on side. So you need allies with that. Um, and all of this is done subtly. It's, it's insidious. It's not obvious, is it? This is things that we have to do in order to have our armory be able to survive. 
you don't go to somebody and say, look, will you have my back and watch out for me because I'm, I'm really good and I've, I've got a first in this or I've got a very competent in that and I've got these qualifications. You don't do it that way, do you? We have to do it by them finding common ground with them. And I think I've had to, we've had to work on that. And that's one of the ways in which then people will treat you um, as if you're the same. And then they, they go past the color of your skin, don't they? They go past your gender. Um, so that does take a lot, I think. Uh, that takes quite a lot of hard work. And that's something additional we have to do. I'm sure you found that as well, Jessica. That's something additional, as well as doing the task and the job and the casework and everything else. You're having to think about those relationships. And that relationship handling is one of the ways in which I think um, it, you, you have to have as part of your tactic and strategy. Yes. You're absolutely 100% right. Thank you so much for answering that. It's exhausting <laughs> just talking about it, but it is part of our life and it's, it's what we have to live with. Yes. But just with it, are you able, um, one of the things we do now, and I, and I hope you're doing this, is, is, is building the network for people like us who have got those experiences. Um, so have those women's groups, those networks where we, where we talk about these issues and it's a safe space where we can talk about it. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Mentors, I've like literally had to go out. Initially, you know, when I joined the profession about 13 years ago, uh, it was just about finding the mentor because I joined litigation and I thought whoever is the best lawyer out there is the best person to teach me. And yeah. with time, you realize you need to really have mentors who are women, who can yeah. actually tell you about things that, you know, you are struggling with. So 100% yeah. with you on that. Yeah, yeah. great, great. Well, good luck, and I hope I hope you build networks and pull people in and do all of that mentoring and supporting because we've we've got that dual role, haven't we? When we get into these senior positions, we've got to think about bringing other people through and sharing our experience. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Good luck. Ravisha, do you want to? Um, yes, I just want to thank you first of all for. Um, like it was so inspirational honestly uh, to know about your journey it's been wonderful um so some people have posted some questions i'll just uh, uh mm -hmm. read that out so that you know maybe we can go through that uh mm -hmm. zafar has posted in um, in many ways the indian criminal justice system is still very much based on the foundations laid by the british mm -hmm. yet the modern criminal prosecution system is drastically different uh, so his question is, what do you feel may be some of the best practices or measures that Indian prosecutors can take away from, from Britain and adapt them for the socio-economic realities of the current Indian landscape? Wow, that's a big question. Yes. <laughs> that's a really yes, big so question. Just, and I thought, I thought well, the Indians did not like to learn from the British anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, Zafar is also into criminal litigation, so it's a... Yeah. I, yeah, I can and see. And Zafa is one of the committee members as well. Yeah, hi Zafa. Yeah, no, that's a really, it's a really big question. It's a really um, a, a good question. Um, and there are lots of things that I think we we do do well um, in this country um, around criminal justice and prosec prosecution, um, which is the kind of fairness of um, and the transparency of our decision making, which is one of the key things. So if as a prosecutor, I make a decision on a case and I decide not to proceed with it, then I provide a written explanation or I have a meeting with the victim to explain my thinking and why I didn't go with the case, however, however minor or however serious. And some of those meetings, it's called the victim's right to review, can be quite challenging um, because they... Your, your, your authority is questioned, but we've got that established now. And if they don't like your decision, then they can appeal your decision to an independent prosecutor from another division within the Crown Prosecution Service. And I think that's helped with transparency. And, and I think that's one of the key things which does give that integrity to our decision making. Um, we don't prosecute on behalf of victims. We prosecute on behalf of this, well, on behalf of the king now, because it's um, our verses, um, and we prosecute in the public interest. And I think that's what um, really kind of helps the kind of confidence in the criminal justice system. 
together with our disclosure regime, where even if we have something that undermines the case for the prosecution, or it might assist the defense, we're under an obligation to disclose that information, even if it means that it's going to have a detrimental impact on the prosecution case. So I think there are a couple of things around transparency, openness, and full disclosure, which is now enshrined in law um, that would um, really help. I think the other kind of thing for us, and it's something which I'm sure um, both India, um, the UK and other jurisdictions will have, is just the explosion of social media offences and how we deal with this. So do we need global laws to deal with this anonymity of abusing people online and the hate crime that exists and what the corporate responsibilities ought to be in terms of prosecuting that? Because there's huge offending that goes on. So it's it's gone off from the street, from face to face, onto uh, into social media. So how do we ensure that we, we're able to deal with those challenges? And there's some of the kind of, I think, social um, realities of the current life in which we can live and how we communicate. So I think that's just a couple of things there, um, Zafa, which um, are kind of food for thought. I don't know if you want to kind of come back on that, but hopefully that's something which, and I, and I need to learn a lot more about the, which I'll get kind of adjunct to help me with, I need to learn a lot more about the Indian prosecution system um, as well. And in fact, the CPS are hosting, and I've got, and I, I, I spoke to the director of public prosecutions about it. We're hosting the International Association of Prosecutors in the UK in September. I don't know if we've got Indian prosecutors coming, because if we haven't, we need to get them to come along. Well, I'll help you in that process. Yeah, thank you, Ajit. We'll yeah, we'll, we'll get some uh, prosecutors from India to come over. I think uh, Zafar has got one more. Hi. Uh, yes, I'll just thank you for that. And I think uh, what you said with regard to the social media crimes, I think especially, you know, the teenagers and the generation that's yeah. growing up now, they are facing a lot of bullying from anonymous yes. accounts. And that, yes. I think, creates a lot of issues, a lot of insecurities. And yeah. then they grow up to be, you know, individuals who are probably not uh, fully secure uh, or things like that. And that yeah. leads to a bigger problem. Yeah, absolutely. And it leads to lots of mental health issues, which we're finding is increasing in this country. But where's the responsibility lie? Because deterrence is better than prosecution. To stop these happening in the first place is much better than having to then prosecute the cases. So how do we ensure that we reduce this type of offending online? There's got to be the corporate responsibility, hasn't there, for on the social media companies? who aren't taking Definitely. their responsibilities seriously in regard to this. So they're enabling a platform to allow all of this criminal offending to take place online. But what are their checks and balances? How are they putting their millions of pounds that they earn into stopping this offending online? They don't stop it. So I think the focus has to shift and the narrative has to shift in relation to this because Prosecuting cases is one thing. We can be prosecuting these cases forevermore, but let's try to reduce this type of offending. And that's what we need to get these big corporates on, on board in relation to it. But Ravisha, you're absolutely right. It's having a huge impact, isn't it, on youngsters? Yes. And I think, I think lockdown Definitely. had a huge impact. And I think lots of offending. Um, we've, got, we, we've got the kind of dark web where we've got um, internet porn and child images yes. and child sexual abuse that happens so that when well, we've got laws that deal with it but to investigate those cases and and it's worldwide it's not just based in your own jurisdiction jurisdiction yes no, that's definitely there um i'll just read out the other question that zafar had yeah. um thank you for that uh, what are your hopes from India UK BIT? Do you feel that they will help address issues of diversity in the legal profession in their respective countries? I, I hope so, because I think this is where we can learn. So where, where we think we've had similar journeys, uh, we've had similar challenges, 
Um, I mean, India is vastly kind of different in terms of population and demographics and diversity and background from the UK. You know, we only have 80 million odd people who kind of live in the kind of UK and we have a, a, a very um, a small um, kind of jurisdiction, um, but a very powerful one, as you said, the, the Indian legal system is based on um, the principles um, from the UK. And I think we have to kind of question and challenge and, and there will be parts of India where there is there's been great strides for women um, who have done extremely well um, and at, they're at the top of the game that we could learn from here. And I think building those partnerships and those networks where you can see it's happened somewhere else, um, you can use those. It gives you strength. It gives you um, 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 an agenda to be able to kind of talk about. It's visually really successful. And when we can show those types of images and show how well when you have so many Asian female justices and judges, and we can show the judiciary here, this is what's happening in India. And this is how powerful it is. And this is the system there that I think that will make a huge difference. Especially when the, the Indian system based on the UK system is very highly regarded as well. It's not as if it isn't, it is. Um, so there will be, um, I think that could make a, a, make a difference. So I think we, we, we need to be hopeful and we need to be positive um, ab about this. <laughs> no, definitely, I think we need to be open to that, uh, you know, the um, crossover and learning from each other. So, yeah. Yes. Um, there's and just another sharing, question. Sharing Sorry. trips and sh just sharing trips, sharing um, challenges. Um, uh, you know, and, and Ajit does this very well. Being able to kind of bring us all together to understand together. each other's worlds, and then, as I said in earlier, find that common ground, um, because that yes. common ground is going to happen whichever part of the world you're in. Discrimination. Yeah. That is. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, there's another question. It's uh, an, from an anonymous attendee. Um, so they are asking, uh, how was the market in the UK for foreign um, bracket Indian lawyers considering the recession? Would it be open for more Indian lawyers, you know, um, anytime soon? Do you think there's, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, there's, we've got a shortage of lawyers in the UK. So we are, we, we've got a very small pond and we're all fishing from the same ponds because we don't have a judicial pathway in this country you have to be a lawyer first and then you become a judge after that and that can take a long time so there aren't enough lawyers to go around um, and we've had disparity in fees as well which meant we didn't have enough prosecuting barristers um, in criminal law um, but there are opportunities um, as long as the qualifications are kind of recognized uh, the experience they kind of recognise, and I don't, and I and I don't know enough about that, so I can't kind of comment to see whether or not that's an area mm -hmm. that's being considered or looked at to see if we need to open it up. It's not something I've heard um, in my um, in, in my circles um, at the moment, um, but I think in the future we've got huge backlogs because of COVID in our trials, um, um, both in civil and in criminal law in this country. So there are opportunities here, but it would be a question for ensuring that the professional societies, the Bar Council, the Law Society, mm -hmm. um, and the kind of government um, is agreed on the um, conversion or any additional qualifications that need to be undertaken um, to allow um, lawyers to practice from India. I'd be supportive of it. If it meets all the right standards, then I don't have an issue. I think um, that would be good. In fact, uh, right now that's happening. There are many Indian lawyers who are coming over here for their masters. They're getting yeah. a job and they're staying over here. And from, in fact, from CCLS, which I think is one of the premium institution uh, where we all belong to. Uh, yeah. There, there, there are a lot of uh, lawyers who came from India, did their masters, and now yeah. they're working in... Uh, some of the most respectable law firms. Yeah. So that is changing. There was a time it was very difficult, but right yeah. now, yes, of course it's changing, but yeah, everybody is not getting job. And it yeah. depends on your personal capabilities and the, the uh, potential as well. 
Absolutely. And as I always say, the, the world's becoming a smaller place. Yeah. We're connecting much more strongly. Um, business is global. Uh, crime is global. Um, immigration is global. So all of those kind of big ticketed issues require legal knowledge from all parts of the world. That's good to hear then, Ajit. One more good thing which came uh, last week when uh, the uh, treasurer of uh, Inner Temple, where you, where yeah. you are from, uh, yeah. and uh, Mahatma Gandhi was also from the same uh, uh, Inner he, Temple. He was, same yes, place. yes, he absolutely, he was there. Yeah, yeah. he's got, got a big photograph of him there in Inner Temple. <laughs> yes. 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 So yeah. So the uh, uh, treasurer, Sir Robert uh, Francis, he was the, he was at uh, dinner, which I hosted in Delhi, and he went to Supreme Court and he was very impressed. Uh, yeah. how Supreme Court of India and other courts in India have adapted to technology. And his comment was, India is far ahead when it's come to adapting technology in judiciary. Mm. So which, which was quite welcoming. Being yeah. in India at times, we don't realize that things are happening and happening at a faster pace. So uh, maybe uh, at, at some point, Indian judiciary might be a role model, but yeah. uh, uh, there are a lot of challenges. Well, I spoke, I spoke last night at the Indian High Commission and the High Commissioner hosted us um, and I did a talk there last night on innovation and technology. And yeah. I was talking about technology and how it helps, it can harm and help in criminal yeah. justice in this country. Um, and we were kind of touching on the use of artificial intelligence and how helpful that can be. So we had a very interesting discussion, a very different one with a different panel. Um, and there was a, a minister from India who was on the kind of panel as well. Um, but it was kind of hosted there by the High Commissioner, a very good um, event talking about exactly that. So I think there's there's yep. a lot of opportunity there, isn't there? Exactly, exactly. Def definitely, but and I think COVID has uh, done that for the judiciary at least, you know, people got online because they couldn't do it physically. And the current Chief Justice of India, he's quite all about, you know, promoting technology and that everybody yeah. should have access to it, basically, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. One of the things we have kind of here is um, when when lockdown happened, um, the very following day, all my prosecutors could go and appear in court uh, remotely because we, we were linked into the court system called CVP. And that worked really well because it was adversity and uh, everybody was happy to do it. Now, the judges want us all to appear in court because they want to see the whites of the eyes of the defendants. And I think that's a step back because we, we made so much advancement and we were able to be more efficient um, in that way. Um, and it's what I said, they like their old tradition. They like to do things the old fashioned way and that doesn't help. <laughs> no. Yes. So we in fact had a, uh, very, on the same topic of technology, we had a very unique case in India where uh, a certain number of lawyers have been pushing for transcription. So Indian mm -hmm. courts didn't have any transcription yes. uh, facility yeah. or process. Yeah. And uh, it was basically technology that led through. So two weeks ago was the first case ever in India where we had transcriptions. Uh, and wow. it was only because everything is online and then transcription yeah. is you know, also possible automatically. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. Excellent. And we've so, had, we've had um, a few kind of trials. Sorry, I'll, I'll just mention this. We've had a few trials where we've had um, the jury all with iPads, especially in the fraud cases. So we don't have paper based. They, they've got access to individual iPads and we can take everything to that. But now routinely in this country, all our cases we prosecute electronically and digitally. All our papers are served digitally. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah, Jesse. The these guys, they don't realize how busy you are and how, <laughs> That's all right. how much time you have already given to us. <laughs> no, you're more, you're more than welcome. I find it fascinating. And um, I'm more than happy to give up my kind of time um, for this kind of wonderful group and to be able to share my experiences and, and for them to listen. And this is what we were talking about, Ajit, which is building the connections and learning and inspiring from each other. And I've learned so much as well um, from the fantastic kind of roles um, that you carry out there. So, yeah, I, so I would like to extend an invitation on behalf of CCLS India chapter. Whenever you are in India, uh, we would like to host you uh, and we would like to meet you in real life. Uh, 
and get inspired. Those who are not here today, they would definitely like to see you again. So look forward to seeing you again. If we don't have any other questions, uh, shall we let Jesse go? Because she has got a very, very busy life. Yes, thank you so much. It was such a wonderful session and very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And it was wonderful to meet you all. And Ajit, thank you very much for organizing it. It's a lovely opportunity. And have thank a great so rest of the day. Thank you so much, Jesse. And thank you. happy Women's Day uh, to all of you. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, uh, this session is inspiring for all ladies and not only ladies over here, the guys. Uh, and we'll bring more inclusiveness and we'll, uh, we'll help each other to grow in progress. Thank, thank you, so you. Much, Jesse. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.